delighted to have Sherry Lemke here to talk about her new book, A Bag of Penny Candy. Uh, Sherry is a graduate of the University of South Dakota in Yankton and earned a nursing degree from Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. She and her co-author, Ann Laughlin, are both natives of Cherokee, Iowa. Unfortunately, Ann could not be here today, um, but they've been working on some books about Iowa history. They ended up collecting stories from 34 women from Iowa and other states in the Midwest, and those reminiscences are going to be deposited here at the State Historical Society in our collections. So I'm sure excerpts are used in these books, but the much longer narratives will be available for researchers who hope to look at them. Uh, they're going to recall their childhood experiences during the Great Depression of the 1930s, but also bring us up to date on their lives and how that, how that experience shaped them. I wanted to bring up a couple of things just for your attention here um, before I continue. Anne is actually a professional golfer. She's in the LPGA, and she's a pro golf instructor right now, so she's in California enjoying the warm weather here. <laughs> Uh, but Sherry's been in our reading room many times, and she's made use of the Pete Weddick collection to illustrate her book. And she looked an awful lot at Wallace's Farmer, at advertisements for modern amenities that were being introduced into farm wife's lives. Uh, she's been here many times, and we hope she'll continue to do research on Iowa history. So let's welcome Sherry. Thank you. This has been a, a wonderful opportunity to, to come and to share with you a bag of penny candy. And yes, Anne does send her greetings from warm and sunny California. And um, I wish she could be here, but she's out on the golf course somewhere. So <laughs> uh, I want to begin and give you an overview of the project itself. And then we can go into the writings. And I'll read to you some of the excerpts from the women, and we'll be able to take a look at some of the photographs and uh, the illustrations that are housed here at the State Historical Society that we've incorporated into the, into the writings. The project itself it took three years from the very beginning until we actually had the completed book. There were actually three phases of the project, and it just so happened each one ended up taking a year to do. The first year was spent on reaching out to women, not only in Iowa, but in the Midwest. And then we went out further to California and out east. We went to Virginia, and there's another uh, woman who contributed from Georgia. So all of the writings came together and just became a real nice collection that gives us an insight into the 1930s. So we can watch these women grow from their early childhood into adolescence, and then they move into the 1940s into um, their adult life and, and womanhood. So that was the, the first year was reaching out and connecting with the women. We only gave them two guidelines. There were only two requisite. The first one was the event that they write about needs to happen in the 1930s. It might start in the 20s and go into the 30s or be in the 30s and kind of um, go over into the 40s. But the main focus was the 1930s. The other um, guideline that we gave them was that the main character in their stories was to be hopefully themselves. If not themselves, then a woman of importance in their lives. So perhaps their mother, a grandmother, a teacher, someone along that line. You know, that, um, that line and that, that filled the story. So those were the only two guidelines. They could write on any topic. We didn't um, restrict them to what they could write on and it could be of any length. And so some of them that um, were submitted were just very small paragraphs. Uh, a couple were actually their own memoirs that they were writing. One was uh, 40 pages in length and I think another one was about 30, 35 pages. And as Mary said, those, those are all coming in their entirety to the uh, State Historical Society here so that if you want to go in and you want to see that whole, uh, that life portrayed from beginning to end, you can, you can do that. Um, so, so we had that, um, that, that differentiation between you know, just small lines and, and full pages and uh, whole memoirs. We didn't realize it at the time, but when we said you can write about anything you want, 
<laughs> you, you know, it, we could have gotten 75% of it on going to school and another 25% on canning. But as it turned out, it was just a really nice mix. I mean, somebody somewhere was watching out for us because we really did get a nice uh, collection out of all of that. So into year two, we started the, the layout and putting the stories together and seeing how they flowed. It was really obvious from the beginning that these stories lent themselves to photos and illustrations. And that's what brought me here to the Historical Society and to work with Mary. And Mary was very gracious at helping us to access the various collections and pulling out material that um, it, otherwise, I wouldn't have known where to go, but Mary just has this real um, a, amazing skill just to go in and to just to know where it is and pick it out for you. So in the end, all in all, we have 10 photos from various collections and 20 illustrations that come from the um, State Historical Society. The end of year two and the beginning of year three we sent the manuscript out to be read. And it went, um, one of our readers was, or is, an oral historian. And one of the other readers was a young, is a young woman in her early 30s who's out in California. And she does some writing for script writing out there. So we had two really different perspectives reading the manuscript. And they both came back with the same comment, and that was, I want to know more. And Anne and I kind of looked at each other and it was like, well, this is the story. This is, we were so focused in on the events that we were writing about. It, it didn't even dawn on us to ask, well, what is more? What they were talking about is going back and catching up with the women and saying, well, what happened? Can you tell us what happened between 1930 and today? How did the 30s impact your life? Are there lessons learned? Are there thoughts that you would like to pass on to, to the reader? And so we went back and we worked with them and they provided us with some really nice sequels that just kind of bring it all together. It just ties up all those loose ends. The other part of um, year three was going through the copy editing. And copy editing is, was quite a challenge for this project because they're not our words, but they're not um, diaries or journals either where you have to go just word for word for word, which is printed. And so our uh, copy editor, we asked him to first go through and just change it, just make everything standardized. And so he did, and it came back, and it was all standardized, and we read it and was like, no, we, we've lost the voice. This isn't the, this isn't the women talking to us anymore. So we went back, and we said, OK, this time, let's go through and just do the punctuation. Just do the commas and the sentence breaks to help us read through it a, a little more smoothly. And so that's what he did. And it retains that voice of the woman. We really wanted it to have that sense that as you're reading the story, they're sitting across from you telling it to you. And so he really did help um, us to preserve that. We also um, have a really well-written, very lovely introduction by Dr. Dorothy Schwader. And Dr. Schwader is a professor emerita in history from Iowa State University. And she graciously accepted our invitation to write the introduction. And it really sets the historical and social context into which these lives were played out. So I want to start by reading an excerpt from Dr. Schweider's introduction that kind of sets the, sets the tone for it. The Great Depression took place in the 1930s. But for many rural people, including those in the Midwest, the 1920s was also a difficult decade. Farmers had experienced prosperity during World War I, and many had borrowed money to purchase additional land. 
When farm prices fell in the early 20s, farm families often found it difficult to make mortgage payments. During the 20s, many small town banks failed. Unable to get loans, small town businesses were sometimes forced to close. With the stock market crash in 1929 and the onset of the depression, the entire nation entered into a devastating and long-lasting economic catastrophe. All classes of Americans were affected, blue and white collar workers, rural and urban dwellers, and our country was not alone. The Great Depression was global in its effect with the United States suffering the most prolonged collapse of any industrial nation. American women everywhere, rural and urban, missed no opportunity to add to their family's income. Women caned chairs, braided rugs, and even raised canaries for sale. They offered services such as catering meals, mending, sewing, and babysitting. Women in both towns and cities took in boarders to add to the family income. One often overlooked fact is that women typically had the major task of keeping up family morale, a seldom mentioned responsibility. The women's remembrances that follow breathe life into the generalization and statistics of the 1930s. Through their eyes, we come to understand more fully the importance of family and kinship, community, church, and even the importance of small gestures and gifts, such as a bag of penny candy. The memoirs that follow provide an up-close and personal view of history that should provide understanding, appreciation, and maybe a smile or two. This is a quote that we have up front in the book, life must be lived forward <clears throat> but understood backward. And for Anne and I, in working uh, with these writings and with the women, and we were together for three years, all of us, this really just it captures their whole philosophy. They were always moving forward, no matter what. They moved forward, forward, forward. And then by sharing their sequel, we can look back and we get a real understanding of what was all encompassed in their, in their life during the 1930s. So for us, this, this quote was really quite meaningful. This is one of the photos from the Pete Weddick collection. It's probably more in the 1940s than the 1930s just by the style of clothing, but it's going to really uh, illustrate the, um, the story that I'm going to read, the excerpt that I'm going, I'm going to read. This excerpt is from ALC. When the women submitted their writings, they had an option to choose how much demographic information they wanted to share. Some used their first name only, some used their first name maiden name, some it was first name maiden name last name, and ALC chose to use her initial, so this is how we have, have ALC. And here's, here's part of her, uh, her writings. We lived on a farm, and my dad always wore coveralls to do farm work. One November, because of bad weather, the corn picking was going extremely slow. So my mother decided she should also get the, help get the corn picked. She always wore dresses and aprons at home. It was so strange to see her dressed up for corn picking. Mom wore one of my dad's coveralls, one of his jackets, stocking cap, and work gloves to go out into the cold and into the field to help pick the corn. Usually my mother didn't help with farm work other than her chickens and her garden. Mostly she was in charge of the house, but sometimes there was a need to do the unusual. At the time that um, this event occurred, ALC was about six or seven years old. So really, it really tells us how well-defined the roles were and how at such a young age it made such an impact to see her mother going out and to helping to the, her, her father and whoever else was out picking corn to bring it in. Um, like she said, sometimes it was just necessary to do the unusual. 
So here is her sequel then. Living during the 1930s, I learned not to take anything for granted. We all have times when we are vulnerable and need great strength and often help from others to move on into the future with a renewed outlook. Always be grateful for the blessings in our life. <clears throat> often used phrases during the 1930s were, look for the silver lining, count your blessings, don't cry over spilled milk, save your pen pennies for a rainy day, and a little hard work never hurt anyone. <laughs> so, this, um, this next one is kind of fun. This is from Jo. And um, she's going to tell us about hair care and hairstyles during her, her probably her adolescence and, and teenage years. Everyone had long hair. Mine was long, thick, and wavy. You had nothing to style it with. You just had your hair. You could wash it, and then we would roll our hair on socks and tie a knot in the socks. If we wanted our hair turned under, we rolled it under and tied the knot. We all had shoulder length hair. Bobby pins didn't help. We just parted our hair. We only washed it once a week on Thursday night for the weekend. If it got oily, we'd put baby talcum powder in it and fluff the powder. <laughs> then we'd brush it out with the hairbrush. That took care of the oil. We wash our hair too often nowadays. It needs oil. Sometimes we would get a perm. They'd snap these rollers on your head. They were steel. There was no plastic then. And they'd bring the big machine over. It's the one on the bottom. <laughs> With dangling um, wires on the end. And they were clipped on the end of the wire. And then they'd clip that on the end of the roller. And then they'd turn on the electricity. And you had to sit there and not move. <laughs> because if you moved your head one way, or another, those things burned you. I had burns on my neck from those, and they, being the beauticians, would stand there with the comb, and they'd say, and you would say, oh, it's burning there. Oh, it's burning over there now. <laughs> and the beautician would pull it away from your neck or wherever it was burning. I had scars on my neck, and it smelled terrible. <laughs> burning flesh and hair, it was called a permanent. It was like an electric chair. <laughs> I want to mention here, um, this comes from the history of hairstyles. And this was one really had difficulty finding, but Mary was able to access this for us. And when Jo saw the book with the illustration, she was absolutely amazed that we were able to obtain that, um, that illustration. She said, that's exactly what it was like. That's it. <laughs> so here's her sequel. After graduation, I attended St. Mary of the Woods College for Women in Terre Haute, Indiana. I attended for two years and went to the University of Iowa, where I met my future husband. We were married on December 27, 1949. A lot of water has gone over the bridge in my 85 years, and fortunately, I did not drown. This is from Dawn, and Dawn uh, is from Montana, and her, um, she, she's one of the women that sent us her whole collection, which is 40 pages, and so it starts at a very young age and then moves clear up to present day. And um, she's, going, she's going to continue on a little bit with this, this hair and uh, thought. Uh, Dad grew a lot of vegetables. He would give us a nickel for picking a Prince Albert tobacco can of potato bugs. They were pretty easy to catch. Then we would set up the wash tub in the yard. It was probably the same tub we all took our Saturday night baths in and wash the veggies. And a little farther down, she continues on. I guess you've heard of Saturday night baths. Well, that is no joke. I don't think there was even deodorant back then. We must have gotten pretty powerful by Friday night. <laughs> and she goes on, she continues on. She said, Mom made our dresses. Flower came in different patterns, sacks, and was used as material. Mom always made us bloomers to match. Oh, were we sexy. 
Of course, no one knew what it meant to be sexy. Everyone was just too busy trying to make a living. In 1939, Dad bought two lots for $75 from the county. He started building the home then. He didn't have fancy tools, just a hammer, plane, level, skill saw, and chisel. He put up four walls, a roof, and a floor with planks, and we moved in. We had tarp for doors. It was in early spring when we had a horrible wind, rain, sleet, snowstorm. The house shook on the planks. We brought the dog, cat, and rabbit in. They got excited and chased each other around and around. We kids, of course, had to get into the act. I think Mom lost it that day. And she, she continues on. We had an outhouse toilet without a roof. At that time, Johnson's Airport was over near Sentinel High School. <laughs> When the planes took off, they always took off over our outhouse. <coughs> My sister Bonnie and I, being as important as we were, or thought we were, always knew that they came that way to spy down on us. In the nighttime, we always went out there together. We were afraid of the dark, and it was dark. No street lights back then, no porch lights or flashlights. We take a box of farmer's matches with us, and don't know how we kept from burning the outhouse down. That would have been a great loss. When we moved there, it was all fields for blocks and blocks. There was just one old shack a bachelor lived in, he and his dog. We got to think of him as family. We would go to the store for him, and he would give us a penny or two. It would take a long time trying to spend two cents on penny candy. I liked those licorice gumdrops. Fred sent us to the store quite often. Maybe he just got tired of our visits. So she refers to penny candy, and she's not the only one. This is a reference that's made many times throughout the stories, and it's where the title for the book came. There were three things that were uh, treats, the, the biggest treats you could imagine. One was the penny candy, next was ice cream, and the third one was going to the movies. And these are reoccurring themes throughout the writings. Um, Shirley Temple was quite popular then. And it was just interesting to see how they worked and how they saved and how they really took their time thinking about what candies they're going to pick out, what kind of ice cream I'm going to have. It's just um, quite, quite an interesting peek into that era. This is an illustration from Wallace's Farmer. And this is written by Marlis, and Marlis is from Minnesota. One day, the teacher was scolding us because someone had broken something. She had a pointer in her hand. She hit the desk to make it a strong statement and broke the pointer. We got her point. <laughs> And she goes on, she continued, one day my brother Glenn had done something the teacher didn't like, so he had to stay after school. My sister Donna didn't like that, so she went outside after school and yelled into the stove vent, you old shit you, and then she ran home. <laughs> and that's all she wrote. But I bet it was pretty interesting at supper that night. <laughs> And she, she continues on, she's right, she's telling us a little bit more. My two brothers, my sister and I wanted bikes. Dad gave each of us a baby pig. He said if we took care of the pigs, he would sell them in the fall and we could have money for new bikes. We bought a girl's bike and a boy's bike. We had half a mile to go to country school. My brother Glenn would pedal my brother Warren. My sister Donna would pedal me. We were so proud of our new bikes. One day, Mom was going to learn to ride the bike. It took a few tries before she finally made the bike go without tipping over. She was pedaling along when the bike went off the road. Mom had not yet learned how the brakes worked. She headed toward the pig pen. The bike stopped when it hit the fence, but Mom didn't. She went head first in the pig pen. I don't recall that she ever learned to ride a bike. And she writes her sequel, the 1930s built a base for my education and vocation in teaching. I learned to appreciate what I had and not to waste it. I learned that people were more important than things and that we should never take them for granted. 
I want to mention here that, as I said, this project took three years. I mean, time was not on our side. Uh, when we go back into the 20s, 30s, and, and 40s, this is really about as far back as we can go and still have that person in front of us to share these memories with. And um, Marlis became, her health started to fail. And in the end, her son helped her write the sequel. He uh, transcribed it for her and sent it to us. So uh, Marlis, Marlis passed away this past April. And when the book came out, we sent a copy to her son. And he was just was so thrilled to see his mother's stories in print. And it was kind of a reminder um, to Anne and I, and probably to all of you as well, is that taking the time to write a memoir or write a story really has a, a powerful impact on those that come after, those in your family. And so it's um, something we all say, oh, we need to do. But then, you know, the time, time goes on. This, this next reading is um, from Olga. And Olga was 88 at the time she wrote the story, so she'd be in her early 90s now. And she's from Illinois. She writes, I was a Depression kid, born of immigrant parents, and lived in a League of Nations neighborhood in Chicago, Illinois. We were not rich and not poor. Father provided pretty well with the basic essentials. There was no money for bikes, skates, etc. Our pleasures were simple, and our days were filled with sidewalk games of sky blue, roly-poly, and best of all, kick the can. Occasionally, a more thrilling sport came our way. The Pepper Brothers ice truck would make its way down the aisle alleyways, delivering blocks of ice to homes for their ice box. They would stand on the bed of the truck and chip the blocks to be carried on their shoulders to the house. The chipping process sent splinters of ice on the truck bed that we kids would pounce on. This was a special treat and felt so good melting down our throats. After Mr. Pepper returned from his delivery, we scattered because we were not allowed to climb on the truck. Everyone but me. I snuck on the back bumper for one last choice mor morsel and felt the truck give a lurch that took me on a ride of rides, clinging to the back bumper. What a ride, down busy streets, over potholes, clinging like mad and screaming to stop. Eventually, Mr. Pepper spotted me in the rear view mirror and pulled, out <clears throat> and pulled over to retrieve me. I could tell he wasn't very cool headed for an ice man. <laughs> By the way, kids like me to grew up to be part of the great generation. And here's her sequel. After graduation from high school in 1940, I earned, entered nursing school at Loyola University in Chicago. I was working in the emergency room when Pearl Harbor happened in 1941. After graduation, I entered the Army as a first lieutenant and was sent overseas to Europe. I was assigned to the 101st General Hospital. After spending several months in Taunton, England, our unit was shipped to the continent. All in all, we eventually established the first hospital in Berlin, Germany. It was the greatest experience of my life. What's interesting here, and Anne and I saw this time and time again as they write about the 30s and then how <clears throat> the 40s impacted their life. And when she says, we grew up to be part of the greatest generation, it's very easy to see that. It's, it's almost as to Anne and I as if that was their destiny. You know, from the, how the 30s impacted them into the 40s, it was like, could it have been anything else? I mean, they were just, um, it was like it was part of their DNA almost. So, <clears throat> going to move on. And the next one is from Lois. And Lois was 91 when she wrote this. So she would be about 94, 95 now. <clears throat> she still lives in her own home where she raised her children. So looking back through the 1930s, they were years of my so-called growing up. Of course, back then, I thought I was already there. I had finally put school behind me, my most unfavorable thing, and could move on to my most favorite, dancing. 
Those were the days the big bands traveled the country, so we had the opportunity to enjoy them in nearby places like Fort Dodge, Twin Lakes, Cobblestone and Storm Lake, Loka, Lake Okoboji, and Sioux City. In those days, we preferred going stag. That way, you weren't stuck all evening with a poor dancer. I recall going to the roof garden at Lake Okoboji when tickets were sold for 10 cents a dance. I'm sure times weren't all good, but those I don't remember. That's one advantage to being 90. You only remember what you want to. <laughs> and here is her sequel. In the late 1930s, I left the family farm for the big city of Des Moines, Iowa to attend the School of Cosmetology. I moved from there to Cherokee, Iowa, where I had a short career. In 1941, I married and proceeded to raise six children. Joe, my husband, and I felt the benefit we derived living through the 1930s was to have money to pay up front or wait until you have it. No charging, as with credit cards. That's the one and only inheritance that we passed on to our children. So, I have two final readings that I want to share with you. And they are, they're almost bookends. They're, they're just in two, come from two different places. But they both have a, a very important place in, in these writings. The first is from Jean Miller, and she was 86 when she wrote this, and this is from North Dakota. <clears throat> it was the summer of 1992, and Tom and I were in Minot, North Dakota for the 50th anniversary of my high school graduation. It was an unscheduled afternoon, and I was driving around town to find the houses or sites where houses had been in which I once lived. My father was a plumber, my mother an ex-teacher. They lost their small home in the crash. We moved across town and I had first grade at McKinley School. Second grade was also at McKinley, but we had moved to a different house. Third grade was in Central School and we lived across the street from the courthouse. We were evicted for non-payment of rent. The next move was to the northeast corner of town and I attended Roosevelt School for fourth and half of fifth grade. We then lived in a small two-bedroom unmodern house out near the fairgrounds. There was electricity and water was available from a faucet or pump across the street. The privy was behind the house on the riverbank. We were poor and so was everyone else. A wonderful program provided employment for the needy, talented people to provide instructions in various arts. I learned to knit, crochet, embroider, and even a bit of painting. This was the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, a summer park program. My father died suddenly in 1938. I was 13 and my brother 11. My mother, although certified to teach, couldn't because of a state law prohibiting married women from teaching. She was named supervisor of the adult night school also a WPA program. She taught a class in Americanism for foreign born who were studying citizenship. After my father's death, mom sold the car and furniture and we moved into a crummy apartment, but with running water. We lived there until high school graduation. My mother did substitute teaching and slowly gained credits towards a standard degree in 1939. The law was changed in 1942, and she was hired full-time. She kept adding college credits and graduated with a bachelor's degree from Minot State College in 1953, seven years after I earned mine. Here's her sequel. My college years were the war years, and the campus became a girls' school until the summer of 1943, when the V-12 Navy officers training took over. My emphasis was math and science, and I had those classes with sailors. They were bright, having qualified by test in high school and boot camp. One sailor and I seemed to often meet at a certain pencil sharpener. He went on to more schooling and active duty. We saw each other after my graduation. I was employed by a newspaper in Minot for a year and married that sailor in 1947. She um, went on to raise a family of 11 children. 
So the next story is from Penny. And Penny is about 90 when she wrote the story. And she uh, was in California as this story is, uh, was written. I tried to think about what we did in the 1930s. Covering 90 years is difficult. I was born in 1921. My biological mother died when my sister and I were born. We were adopted by a prominent pioneering family in Portland, Oregon. My adoptive father died when we were five years old. Then my mother married and we moved to Pasadena, California in 1930. We lived in Beverly Hills. We lived near Mary Pickford, Gloria Swanson, Bob Hope, and Jack Benny. We had a shepherd collie dog and we'd put on our skates. In those days, they attached to your shoes. We would hang on to the dog and she would take us around the block. Gloria Swanson lived on a hill across the street and she had a long sidewalk in front of her house and we would skate down that. We would wear slacks in the house during the day, but we would never go out without wearing a skirt. My mother always wore hats and gloves we would have to put on a skirt or dress to go shopping or to the market. That was very different. However, we were not spoiled. My mother took us shopping for clothes twice a year, and that was about it. I can't ever remember asking for anything. I don't know why. We just grew up that way. We didn't say, oh, I want this or I want that. We just didn't do that. My mother would say to me in the 1930s, you know, you don't have to marry a man who has money as long as he's honest. Those are the important things. We came from a farming community and they worked hard. I don't want you to think that I'm bragging or anything. It was just a different life. My sister is the same way. We didn't know any different. Everyone else lived the way we did. Everyone had tennis courts and swimming pools in those days and that was it. We had a chauffeur, a maid, and a cook. My mother never learned to cook. Her father farmed and was the editor of the Oregonian for 40 years, and he said, a woman's place is in the parlor. But we learned how to cook and how to pick fruit, and we cleaned our rooms. And in the summertime, we cleaned the house and dusted and always made our beds. And her sequel is, my life was involved with World War II and raising four children. I was very involved in volunteer work. With the children all out on their own, I began to spread my wings, which included earning my master's degree in nutrition, along with my pilot's license. I enjoyed flying in women's air races. Now at 91, I find I'm only swimming after a lifetime of competitive activities. So that's Penny's story. It's, it's interesting because we know they enjoyed movies. We know that they listened to Jack Benny on the radio and Gene Autry and, and all of those entertainment um, options, outlets, provided them some relief during the, the bleakness of the 1930s. And this is a, a look at someone who was raised during and in that, um, that entertainment industry. So with that, Again, life must be lived forward, but understood backwards. And I hope that um, you've enjoyed the readings from Penny Candy. And if you have any questions or any thoughts or comments, I'd be happy to um, visit with you on them. I would like to ask you, uh, how did you find or how did you choose these women? We started very close to home. You know, you always ask your mother first. So we went to our mothers and we said, you know, this is what we're thinking of doing. Do, what do, you th do you think that uh, women of, of your generation would be open to writing us stories about their life and the Depression? And she, th both of our mothers were very supportive of that, as we hoped they would be. So we started with them, and then we began to build a list. We said, well, who do you think might be a good storyteller in your community? And then we would ask friends, do you have anybody in your family that's a good storyteller that would like to share some experiences with us? And then we would ask friends of friends. And we started to gradually cast this wider net. <clears throat> and I spoke with volunteer groups 
and we sometimes it was just a matter of speaking with somebody that you might meet at the you know at, at church or at a program or and you they'd say what are you doing what are you working on and tell them about the project and they'd say oh I know this woman you should really get in touch with she's a wonderful storyteller so in the end we uh, came up with this eclectic group and we were just really happy with the response that we got. Not everybody that we contacted wanted to participate. Many you know, graciously declined. We did have a few that started with us and then decided to go off on their own. They said, I'm going to write my own story. I want to write my own story, which is fine. Um, we did have one lady that decided to opt out because it was just taking too long. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and we were so close. We were closing in on that year three, but she just couldn't wait any longer. So, you know, in the end, we ended up with 34. And we divided the list, and, and Anne had her group, and I had my group, and um, we communicated off and on over the years, and we could go back and talk to them. And we would send them updates. About every six months, we would send a little update. If longer than six months went by, we would get little notes from them. How, how are you coming? How are you doing? Do you need anything else? And the, this um, last spring, as we were moving into the final phase, one lady wrote and she said, now is there anything at all I can help you with? <laughs> and she, just so sweet. But um, you know, time was not on our side. Time, and um, I think they were realizing that even more so than Anne and I were. You uh, read a few excerpts about a, a woman whose family was evicted and lost their house earlier, and another about the the children who lost their mother and then their adoptive father. Were there any that really had very dark memories of the stress and how it affected there the family? There are. Um, one lady writes how a neighbor came home. Um, he had lost everything and he went into the barn and hung himself. Um, there are other stories. Uh, one lady in Chicago writes about how the trucks would come to town and they were the food trucks and people could go and they could get um, food off the wagon. The first ones there, you know, were the ones that got um, most of the food, you know, the kind of first come, first serve. So there are, there are a lot of those stories. Um, oh, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are enough that you get that sense of it. The other thing that we realized is how many children were raised, um, usually due to death, by one parent or the other, or perhaps grandparents. That was quite striking. That was very striking. Were any of the sequels pessimistic or re really regretful? No. No, and that, that was the one thing that threw out all of this. And like Lois says, well, the nice thing about being 90 is you only you remember what you want to. And Dorothy mentions this in her introduction as well, is that, you know, they're looking back now 80 years later. So events can be muted, you know, when you look back that far. But they were all very, very positive, very, even though... They can describe um, losing family in, in Pearl Harbor or the being evicted, you know, any of those events. They always seem to continue to have that hope and move forward. But I was also thinking that women had so much more limited opportunities. They did. And there Absol could be regrets associated with that. You know, I didn't see that. Like, like with Jean, when she talks about her mother not being allowed to teach because she was married at the time. But yet, she persevered, went back to school, you know, earned her bachelor's degree, and moved on. But we, d we really didn't get that feeling of despair from them. The, the acknowledgement that times were tough or difficult, but it was that sense of feeling uh, like Jean writes, you know, we were all in this together. We were all feeling the same thing. So. 
Did you find any journals or letters or personal memorabilia that people had been saving all their lives? Uh, we had one lady who wrote, uh, sent a letter. She also wrote a couple passages, but she sent a letter to us that she had written to her grandson. Her grandson had asked her a few years ago different questions about growing up. And so she had responded back to that. So we have that letter as part of her events. But other than that, everything else was a reflection as, as they're remembering it now in, in real time. And that was really a lot of fun because we could interact with these women. We weren't reading a journal or a diary and saying, well, I wonder, I wonder what. You know, we could go back and we could ask them and that was a real fun part of the, the whole process is that interaction. Like I said, it was three years, so we all kind of got to know each other a little, a little bit. Was that getting to know each other only through the mail, or did you meet many, many of these some of them we Some of them we have met, some of them we will never meet, um, just by their location, like Olga. Um, she wrote a delightful story. She's a friend of a friend of a friend, and, um, you know, we won't. And Penny, I don't know, maybe, maybe on a trip down to California, you know, it could meet up with her. You know, but there are those that... And amazingly, too, a, several of them use email and word processors. A couple use the typewriter. We still we had a, a typewriter written notes. The handwriting was beautiful. The, the handwritten notes. Um, when it came to editing, the spelling was impeccable. I mean, they were, that generation knew how to spell. Um, so, just really, really fun to interact with them. Yeah. Did you read the entire did you read the entire passage of each of the memoirs, or was this just a paragraph that these people sent you? The, what I've read today, many of those are excerpts from a much longer, yeah. mm-hmm. Um, now like with Jean, the one that we read at the end, that's almost her, there were just a few lines that were not included. I, for time, I kind of cut those out. But that's her whole story. And Jean's is really interesting because it's not long. It's not really that long, but it tells you a lot. I mean, there's a lot in that one. Um, everything from moving, you know, the frequent moves to losing her dad to how um, women in their careers were handled and to the, the, the struggles. That's a pretty powerful piece, I think. Yeah. It seems like the kind of project that you could do for any generation, like the 50s, and, and you'd have more informants. Um, is there anything that you would do differently? or? Um? I, think, I, I think the one thing that we really learned was the sequel. And it, it was nice that we caught that before the project was finished. And those two readers were really astute, and they really put us on the right, right path. Um, what I find myself doing now, and, and Anne does, I think, too, is that sometimes you'll be in the grocery store and you'll be shopping, and I'll look over and I'll think, <laughs> I know there's a story in there somewhere. You know, it would be it would be nice to be able to have more than just 34 stories somewhere for people to reflect back on. Um, yeah. Uh you know, you obviously are not someone who grew up in the 1930s. So was it your curiosity about your mother and her generation that led you to this particular group? And I ask that because I myself have written a book which, is, which overlaps with some of your interests, and it's about women born exact, in exactly the same year I was. So I was, I was dealing with people who were my age exactly, but you weren't, and I'm interested why. Well, and, and you, you hit on it. We, um, we grew up, like most of us have, hearing stories from our family that are, that are passed down, you know, especially growing up. You know, when, I was a, when I was a kid, you know, we walked 10 miles to country school, that type of thing. And we had heard these stories reoccurring 
as we grew up, we were growing up. And we, Anne and I were wanting to do another project. And we were having um, coffee one day, and we were talking, for some reason, we were talking about something that happened. We both grew up in Cherokee. We were talking about something back in Cherokee. And it was just like that aha moment. You know, we really need to capture some of these stories because the women that are telling them to us are not going to be with us forever. And, you know, we were thinking in terms of our mothers and the friends that they had lost. So we, that was really the, um, the, the defining event when we decided let's, we're going to do this. And we could have done more, we could have had more writings if we had more time. But I say time was, time really wasn't our friend. Well, let's thank Sherry and Anne for preserving these voices. This is a terrific. <laughs> watching City Channel 4 on TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device.